Hello and welcome to Ham Nation, episode 545 for April 26th, 2023. And how's it going, everybody? I am Josh KI6NAZ. Big thank you for clicking on Ham Nation again this week here on the Ham Radio Crash Course. I want to mention this right up front since uh, it's already been in the chats, and we want to make sure we get this information out there right up top while everybody's watching, right? So Amanda will not be with us today. She is recuperating from her time where she was in the hospital. She got a fairly serious case of pneumonia uh, in which she actually had to be moved from one hospital to another hospital, spent some time in the ICU. She is thankfully out of the hospital. She is recuperating. Uh, but the fine folks at the Rocky Mountain Amateur Radio Club have opened a GoFundMe for her. And they, if, if you consider the cost here, she does have medical insurance, but there is many additional fees that she's going to have to pay in addition to everything else you know she's got going on. And I, I will share a, a, a brief little story that she did tell me. The drive just between the one Colorado hospital to the other Colorado hospital is about 65 miles, and it was over $5,000 just for the one ambulance ride. So I know that there will be racking up of medical bills. So the link is in the description if you uh, care to help out Amanda. We truly appreciate her. She really does help make this show possible. If it weren't for Amanda, this likely would not exist. So, Amanda, we, we care a lot about you. We're, all of our best wishes go to you. And we're going to try to carry on uh, in, while you rest and get better. All right. So let's say hi to our, our host for this evening. We do have somebody in the Amanda spot, so I'll go straight to him. Steve Goodgame is joining us from the ARRL. How are you doing tonight, Steve? Great, Josh. How are you? I uh, I'm glad you could I'm glad you could help out a little bit for the show, and uh, we're gonna be talking to you here in a little bit. So, hang tight. Thanks for joining us. And then across from him, Joe, how's it going? He's back. Yes, I'm back. Uh, the last four weekends, I've been on the road to different ham fests, and I've been working on kits and all sorts of stuff. And I'll be showing lots of pictures coming up. Excellent. And Gordo, how have you been? I have been uh, just great. And coming back, CQ Magazine, they had a, a printing paper shortage. And I'm very happy to say their March issue, a little bit late, but they're now back on schedule. And more good news, the general book finally is coming out, the new one that we just finished. One. Very good. And Don, how are you? Busy, busy, busy. It's the last week of the month and in, in, in the car dealership business, that means there's no days off and it's all 10 and 11 hour days. So uh, I'm tired. And then I just got the Tamitha Scove uh, solar update literally uh, at 7.55. So like seven minutes ago. So that video is now being uploaded to Josh and we will have fresh solar news from Dr. T tonight after the Newsline segment. So the, it's it's going in the Dropbox now, Josh. The freshest of updates. Exactly. That's, that's steaming, that's, as a matter of fact. That's the best. Yes. You can't get better than that. Yeah. No. Uh, I will mention this before we head off to talk to Steve. This is a, a good time to mention, since we're going to be talking a little bit about Hamvention today. The VOA is going to be running extended hours like they have done a couple of years now. So if you are going to Hamvention, I highly, highly recommend you take the, the short little trip over to the museum at the National Voice of America and learn about what they did there. It's really, really a fun time. And so uh, we'll post links in the description as well. But here are the hours. It, it also stays open on Sunday up till 5 p.m. and as late as 9 p.m. on Saturday, Friday, and Thursday. So consider doing that. And when you're there, make sure you go check out their new shack that they just updated. So they've got whole new updates with ICOM equipment and Yesu equipment that is now uh, running and is uh, good to go. So, yeah, make sure you go check them out. That is such a great museum. Every Every American needs to go to that museum. It, it is the history that is there. I mean, when th that was the voice of America and with um, the, the programming coming out of that Cincinnati um, voice of America station, you know, you're doing something right when Hitler refers to you as the Cincinnati liars. Yeah, it's it's really cool history, really fascinating history. And everybody that, that yeah. shares it is just my my wife, who is not a ham and not particularly impressed by all this stuff because she's been around me for 40 years around broadcasting and everything. I took her to that when we went up to Neil Rapp's wedding 
and she's like, oh, my God, everybody needs to be here. So take it from my wife. Everybody needs to go to this this museum. Uh, uh, and to spread a little bit more information and get you excited about Hamvention, we're going to go to Gordo right now for his short shots. So, Gordo, take it away. All right. And, in fact, if you get to uh, Dayton Hamvention, be sure and come a day or two or three early because then you can take in VOA on Thursday. All right. Let's head and talk about the Dayton Hamvention. <clears throat> the volunteers, none are paid. They're all volunteers have been doing Dayton since 1952. And I didn't get going with Dayton until 1979. <clears throat> And uh, they were going strong. They were at the Biltmore Hotel, and then they uh, went out there to uh, uh, New Digs. But, uh, boy, Dayton goes back a long, long time. Back in the early days of Dayton, Ham mentioned in the 70s and 80s and a little bit of the 90s, everybody would dress up, all the exhibitors. Sometimes it was tuxes, sometimes it was a boating theme. You never know what was going to happen out there at the arena. Uh, it was sort of like the unknown. <clears throat> you never know if Elvis was going to be there. Well, you can see Chip and Janet uh, and Dan and Kristen there having a great time. <clears throat> but every year, all of the exhibitors would dress up. Uh, most of them would. And it was it just added to the excitement. <clears throat> and uh, Bob Interbetson, uh, who is with the American Radio Relay League, what a dynamic person, just like Steve. Uh, Bob is there to keep his team always uh, going. <clears throat> and when we asked, well, Bob, uh, are you going to dress up your uh, team? He goes, no problem. <clears throat> and let me tell you, when you get to Dayton, if you have a handheld, especially if it's an imported handheld, give it to these fellows and ladies that will be there, and they'll give it a good thorough going over and tell you that it's all within spec. So Dayton is for everyone, but we have a little bit of tongue-in-cheek when we think about all the excitement. And the very first years, I was uh, there with uh, Standard Communications, and I had uh, a Japanese handheld, and the folks were literally tearing the shirt off my back to get their <laughs> hands on a crystal-controlled handheld radio with, wow, catch this, for two meters, six channels. <laughs> Dayton was fun. But after a few years, the facility, the Hera Arena, was taking its toll. <clears throat> and there would always be more cracked concrete barriers keeping people from uh, uh, falling into or off of. Uh, we had drip buckets. <clears throat> and this was the fun of Dayton. You never know what would happen. And uh, they even supplied the drip buckets. And all the while, these non-paid volunteers that come in from states away to handle Dayton Hamvention, they were there with a smile and they made things happen. <clears throat> well, one thing that happened was they moved the dates from April to May. Well, why would they do that? Well, when you look at the weather forecast, you'll see, <laughs> as we saw this past week or two or three, a lot of adverse weather comes in in April. But for some reason, right after May Day, uh, things begin to open up. So we're hoping this year for great weather and just know that <clears throat> the three to four week move really made a big difference for those with outside exhibits. But back in the old days, we didn't let a little bit of uh, cold weather uh, cause us to quit operating. <clears throat> Those outside uh, in uh, the grassy area at Dayton, they would simply uh, bring out their uh, tarpaulins, their clear plastics, <clears throat> and uh, get uh, uh, on with uh, working the world from their uh, HF setups. <clears throat> You never know what's going to happen at Dayton. Uh, here we were after a little bit of rainstorm, and there was like water on. Well, it, it didn't smell like water. Oh, it, it was no. like, well, uh, oh, and then, no. boom, and a 10-foot oh, no. geyser came from the plumbing system, and it sent uh, the swappers uh, scambling. No, I didn't get a picture of the geyser, but that's a little bit of the proceeds because people were wondering, hmm, are we on like an atomic fault? Because uh, some of the uh, water kept uh, coming up and coming up <laughs> until it let loose. And then there was a year that we had a little bit of snow at Dayton, followed by a big thunderstorm. And again, for those outside swappers, they didn't go home. They could just, just bundle up and cover everything up. 
Well, except for the wind that sometimes uncovered them. But nonetheless, no matter what happens in Dayton, uh, all the volunteers with the Dayton Ham mention, they will get folks through. They came right out there and were helping put up canopies again. Uh, that's Frank, AA2DD. <clears throat> um, he is, uh, he's out there uh, surveying a little bit of uh, the damage and uh, we, we survive. Well, unfortunately, Hera Arena did not survive this. And that was a big tornado. And that tornado, as you can see, just ripped it up uh, the Hera Arena <clears throat> to pieces. And um, it exposed a lot of things that people never knew, but a few of us. And you see the little brown buildings at uh, about the middle of the screen down low? Uh, those were part of offices, but actually they had a full a uh, full tilt uh, bar on uh, the one closest to us and on the far one, uh, they, well, take my word for it. There was a lot of things happening at the Dayton uh, um, uh, Hera Arena that uh, <clears throat> beside hockey and all of the other things, it was a hotel for a lot of people. <clears throat> well, we moved out to the Greene County Fairgrounds and what <clears throat> a wonderful move. They're in Xenia, and you remember Xenia is where they had the huge tornado that absolutely wiped out the town. We'll talk about that in two weeks to get you ready for you never know what's going to happen, but probably not a tornado. And the fairgrounds just been over backwards. The town of Xenia absolutely been over backwards. And the committee members, they were just delighted. New gig, fresh new things. <clears throat> Well, where to put the swappers? Oh, there was no question about it. Put it on the sulky uh, uh, track uh, in the center and look at all that grass area. Oh, wow, this is gonna be great. There will be plenty of room for all of the swap meet folks that wanna go outside and enjoy the fresh air. And on that uh, first time, they did just that. Nice green grass, nice soft ground. Everything was wonderful until it rained. And when it rains uh, at Xenia or Dayton or wherever in Ohio, it rains, but only for a few moments, <clears throat> but it gets your attention. This is from one of the buildings and water was generally pouring everywhere. But unlike Hera Arena, this new facility, the fairgrounds, there was no rain coming into or on top of the buildings. <clears throat> Well, Michael Kaltzer, Michael goes back to Dayton all the way in the good old days. He knew Samuel Morse. No, not really. But anyway, <laughs> remember the name, Michael Calder. He's the one that has led us into so many success stories. He said, well, what we need to do is to come up with walkways so that when people are walking on this wonderful infield to see all the swap stuff, um, they won't get bogged down in mud. So, he did. I don't know where he got the tractor. I don't know how he filled the roller, but that's Michael. And uh, this is a man that does not stop making Dayton Hamvention happen. So thank you, Michael, and all of your team members, hundreds and hundreds of team members for keeping Dayton going. <clears throat> and for those of us in the military, we all remember military radios, and um, <clears throat> they had a couple of live ones. And you're probably saying, well, who are you going to talk to on 160 meters uh, with that little whip? And these guys were like cranking and cranking away. They had their 160 meters set up. They were making contacts and in the evening hours made some skywave contacts. But we always have a rover. <laughs> the, this rover right here, and that's Dan, he's making things happen on a handheld <clears throat> Uh, uh, walkie-talkie. I think that's more on like 75 meters, but um, he was in contact. And that was sort of the new Dayton, a new twist. And that is, uh, instead of all the wild outfits that the exhibitors were wearing, people were walking around with all these portable setups. And it's also the period that a lot of public safety departments switched from 400 megahertz up to seven and 800 megahertz, actually 800 back then. <clears throat> so if ever you were looking for some uh, 440, 450, 460 megahertz antennas or equipment, there are truckloads and there will continue to be truckloads as uh, uh, more agencies that get off of UHF and go up into the 700 megahertz uh, uh, digital area. And if ever you needed a connector, 
There's boatloads and truckloads of them there at Dayton every year. So Dayton is almost like a museum for some stuff, just looking around and seeing what's there. Yeah. Well, sometimes you see a little too close. You don't realize it. They had to put uh, their forums uh, signs uh, over uh, the assembly uh, building. And, well, they got it over the blee part of assembly, but they left the ass on there. So no problem. After a day, they were able to get it all uh, solved away. So that was the great thing about uh, Dayton is you never know what's going to happen, and they were very quick to make it happen. And um, <clears throat> let's see, Josh, uh, when is our uh, get-together? Because this was uh, an earlier one of Ham Nation, Bob Heil, and all the ladies. Uh, what have we got, Josh, for a meeting at Dayton? It will be Saturday at 9 a.m., first showing in uh, Building 1 or Forum 1. And it is posted on the website. <laughs> there you go. So Josh will be the staple. He'll be leading and he'll have the whole team. But uh, and Josh, all of us, uh, the originals that you see up there on uh, stage from Ham Nation, thank you for uh, carrying on uh, all the fun that we've had. And let me tell you, folks, it's going to be a crowd. So uh, come bright and early and expect a great uh, time. And um, Tamitha will be there, I'm sure, to tell you, or if not, she'll be there in uh, video to tell about all the excitement we've had this past weekend. Wow. Uh, solar uh, solar storm uh, leading to auroras this far south in L.A. I didn't see it, but Joe will tell you more about it. Joe, you saw an aurora, is that right, when coming back from your ham fest? Yeah, from Visalia, uh, between Denver and Omaha, my flight was late enough at night. I, I could see the aurora from the air, uh, really something. Uh, it was kind of fuzzy because there was a bit of high altitude haze, but very interesting. Well, that's great. And did you have advance notice? It might be, or did they announce it from the cockpit? They didn't, but uh, I had a good idea when I saw we were <laughs> hitting a G4 <laughs> geomagnetic storm. There, there you go. So tonight, uh, from what Don indicates, you got a powerful uh, talk from uh, Tamitha. In fact, Don, there you are, and he's on, it looks like, uh, 700 megahertz. Is that right, Don? <laughs> I think that's my evil twin lawn, Gordon. <laughs> so what's your best part of Dayton you remember? Oh, my God. Probably, you know, going back probably to the first time I ever went, which was 1999, um, it was just just amazing uh that was when they had the banquet they still had the banquet and uh, joe walsh performed live which was very very cool but so many memories so many memories of of dayton and hera and and i actually i loved Hera. i, I just as with all of its quirks and warts and pimples and hairs sprouting out of wherever and geysers in the parking lot. I loved that building. I really did. I, but I mean, <laughs> as, as, that. Well, as, as cool as that was, you know, um, of course, um, Xenia is so much better. But yeah, I, I just love it. Don always had a fan club uh, following him around. But one year he couldn't <laughs> make it. But wait a minute. Yeah, we saw Don. He was sort of like motionless. This Flat was Don. a full size cut up of Don and yeah. uh, was uh, a big smile. So uh, thank you for always being there, Don. I still, I, yeah, even when I'm not there, I'm there. And in fact, that that's uh, that was in my office at iHeart at the radio stations for a couple of three or four years. And when I left there, it came home with me. So it's uh, it's actually, it's in my living room, actually. Right I remember now. taking the picture that was made from. That's right, <laughs> you did, yeah, that's right. You also, so, you also, Joe, took the picture that is my QSL card of my arm tattoo. So, that's yeah. right. <laughs> There you go. So you never know what's going to happen at uh, Dayton uh, Hamvention. All right. Uh, in fact, Joe was always there, always had a nice wild hat. Joe, you still have the same hat? Yes, I do. Of course, uh, what you're seeing there in the picture is the newest edition of the famous Cat in the Hat. And uh, it's been a tradition since 98. So... Uh, every year, uh, you'll see me wearing it and you see that big button from ICOM from Dayton 86 on there. So it shows that I've been there for quite a while and, uh, I, I always wear it because that's how everybody finds me in that huge crowd there at Hamvention. And, and I heard, 
uh, Mike Coulter on another webcast uh, a short time ago was mentioning that ticket sales are above last year already, and uh, there's fewer empty uh, uh, booth spaces available, and there won't be tent exhibits outside again, uh, so everything will be inside under under the roof. And I will be there uh, actually on Thursday. I'm going to be the talk in net control from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the local repeater. Uh, you'll what hear me on. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, what oh, could go man. wrong? <laughs> so I did this last year too. And there you so, go. Well, Joe, so, thanks for all you do for uh, oh, uh, and, making uh, Dayton uh, the Friday, best. Friday at 11.30 in the morning, uh, room four is kit building. There you go. And they have plenty of uh, signage to let you know where room four is, but that's one of the big assembly hall rooms um, that uh, you'll be at. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you there. Well, the inside exhibits, there are uh, four uh, big uh, buildings. Um, they don't have air conditioner, but they do have air conditioning with all the wind that uh, sometimes comes up. It never got stifly hot, and it is so well lit, unlike uh, Hera Arena. Uh, it's lit so much that you just can't miss a thing, and uh, it's always fun. And we have special guests. That is from Last Man Standing, uh, one of the young men that came by to say hi and uh, had also passed his uh, ham radio test. And uh, that is Eric. Uh, Eric is uh, the technical editor for Master Publishing and some of our books. And he's like going to take home an antenna tower to Alaska. No, I don't think it's going to be that uh, tower. And they will have testing as well. And uh, the testing team, let me tell you, they do such a great job at the Dayton Hamvention because they get folks in and out so you're not tied up all day taking an upgrade exam. And as you can tell, <clears throat> there's a very happy ham that he made it. And, of course, there was, as I said, plenty of signs. Uh, for guys, I'm not quite sure about this one, but uh, we'll figure that one out later. And we love this one, uh, Volume 1, The Perpetual troubleshooters manual uh, by john Ryder. wow that'll uh, that'll solve anything electrical like a dvd rewinder <laughs> a lot of humor out there at dayton i need that and speaking of humor we were accosted by this masked man and uh, we couldn't figure out who it was uh -huh. Oh, there we go. ICOM America. They have a major size booth at Dayton. That's Ray Novak. And Ray and his team really dressed the part. And this is at the new facility. So maybe we're going to see more dressed up folks. And of course, everybody had to have their antenna uh, in their hat. But here's one built right into hair. And this young lady, uh, now a mom, uh, was uh, spouting her uh, call sign <clears throat> high atop uh, her uh, three-element tower. And Joe will probably be over here overseeing a lot of kit building. This is for kids, and Dayton Hamvention uh, volunteers do a fabulous job. And, yes, all the kids were wearing protective lenses. They were all in an area with that uh, there wouldn't be any um, <clears throat> hazards. And it was a, uh, a small room just for building neat little kits. So if you got kids, be sure and bring them. So Dayton has something for everyone. And for those of you into uh, food, as we all are, uh, there you go. They will have even more food vendors. And if you look in the background, the American flags and so on, as long as they're in that direction, you're in pretty good shape. They should go in the other direction and you see big clouds. It'll only last for an hour or so. And that'll be a good time to see the inside exhibits and then you can go back out. And if you get bogged down, and need a little bit of medical help, they are there. And these are all professionals, not just EMTs as I once was, but also paramedics. So they've got a full complement of uh, there for the hams. So as Ray Novak would say, get your butt to Dayton and get there a few days early to take in the town of Xenia, Go to the library and see how that uh, tornado literally wiped out the entire town and know that they've come back, just as Dayton Ham mentioned, is always coming back and is the best. And Stephen, I bet we'll see you there at Dayton or uh, a ton of league officials, right? Yep, I'll be there. I get there 
Thursday, and I didn't get there until Saturday last year, so I'm going to blame Joe for the bad talking directions. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one day as as being a guest host, and look at this guy. He's already. <laughs> I got to blame somebody. I, I can't blame my kid. I was actually late because I, I stayed for my daughter to graduate high school, and I flew in Saturday morning. But I'll blame Joe anyway. It sounds better. So All it's right. A better, it's a there better story to blame Joe. Yeah. So that's my date and report. And uh, in two weeks, uh, we'll give you a little bit more on the town of Xenia, as well as some more outtakes on uh, all that uh, the uh, hundreds of volunteers, no one gets paid for pulling this off, but the ham community and what a great show. So Josh, back to you. Oh, thank you very much, Gordo. That was great. Fantastic. I love those. We got a couple of comments in the chat for you, basically saying thank you for sharing your scrapbook, your wonderful memories from Hamvention, and just all the things you share. We really do appreciate it. So thank you for that. Well, Roger that. well Steve, you are a, uh, you, you've been a busy man. Um, I think you added frequent flyer to the list uh, this year and last year in particular. You've been everywhere for the league i have recently. been everywhere so <laughs> yeah. I, I i you've got some wonderful pictures you shared with us as, as we'll get to but why don't you kind of give everybody of a nutshell what what you've been up to or or guess start with just what the heck is the awrl education and learning manager so apparently the awrl education and learning manager deals with everything that's awrl no it's um <laughs> it's you know i have I guess several hats that I wear um, right now, but the biggest hat I'm wearing is Teachers Institute. Um, and that's what all my, or a large number of my air miles are coming from is we're traveling around to teacher conventions and just, you know, letting science teachers and whatnot know that amateur radio is here and it's it's a great part of, of STEM education. Um, letting them know that amateur radio today is not the same as it was, you know, 50 years ago which is a very common misconception. Um, and so, you know, we for years when I, I've been here almost two years now, and initially they were having trouble filling these Teachers Institute things. You know, they had a couple of year, and when I got there, I said, well, where are we going to get teachers? And they were going to ham fests, and that's the wrong pond. Yeah, You know, we were fishing in the agree. wrong spot. So we started going to teacher conventions, science teacher conventions, and – you know, now I've got five sessions that'll be full this year. Well, so what's and, the growth been like? I mean, obviously, it sounds like it's on the up, up and up, which is great. But like, in your in your time, kind of in this role, what what's that been like as far as growth? Um, well, we've more than doubled the number of sessions, and I actually have people. I mean, I could fill five more of these easily wow. in a year. I I just don't have funding for it. You know, I have the way it's paid for is we have a certain fund the education technology fund that is allocated just for teachers institute mm -hmm. and you know the idea is we don't want to dip into the principal balance we you know it's i don't know all the accounting terms for it diane middleton keeps me straight on all that but uh and then you know so like i don't i don't pay for any of the travel to teacher conventions out of that fund everything that goes in there is purely for the institutes themselves and then all my travel to conventions comes out of regular budget stuff. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Teacher Institute and what teachers actually do when they when they kind of come to the event or events? So, so this year we're changing it. Um, one of the first things I wanted to do when I got there is I watched how the program was laid out. It's been laid out kind of sort of the same way for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. Oh. Um, and, I mean, it, it was a solid program, but – at the same time, it, it never really evolved with, you know, time. So when I got there, I sat there and I watched them all um, and met with the instructors. And we just, you know, decided to make some changes, things that teachers could use immediately. Like, you know, for example, um, every teacher that comes is now getting two handheld radios. Um, they're getting a Yaesu FT-70 and they're getting a, a Baofeng. Um, they're getting the bow thing for two reasons. One, it's cheap. And two, kids and teachers need to understand that ham radio can be inexpensive to start. And two-way, just alone for demonstration purposes, right? Yeah. Um, and, well, it makes more sense in a minute. Also, we're oh. also getting them an aero antenna. Ah. Um, and with that aero antenna, obviously, we can do some satellite stuff. So having those two radios comes in handy there. Um Every teacher is getting a Bionics Fox. So 
as soon as they get back to school, they can immediately put it to use and you'll have kids fox hunting. Um, they're still getting the Arduino microcontroller kits and learning how to use that stuff and basic electronics kits. And if I can squeeze it into the budget, we're also going to get a good soldering station form and an SDR dongle as well. Oh, wow. So I'm going to pull up this brochure. This is also something I, I think you were involved in too as well, right? This brochure. Yeah, we redesigned all of the brochures and stuff. So, you know, that's, we're, we're accepting applications now. Um, you know, like I said, I've got, I don't know, 60 something, 75 ah, that's applications. Um, and, you know, it's right now we have four sessions in the summer, and then the fifth session is actually in, in the fall in October. Wow. Uh, because a lot of people, school districts have different rules as far as when they can send teachers to staff development, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. And I'm also meeting with, like I met today with, there's a, a private science center on top of a mountain here. And so we're, we're looking at their, they kind of do, well, it's a science center, so there, there are people. <laughs> and so, you know, we're going to get us, get some, some work done in there. There's a magnet school program here that we're meeting with. So, you know, we're, we're reaching out not just to public school teachers. We opened it to homeschool co-ops. Um, when it comes to people who have a lot of freedom in what they teach and how they teach it, homeschoolers have, have a ton of it. Um, private schools, even university level stuff we're open to. So this is a week long event that teachers come to. And I believe that, I mean, from their point of view, it's a, it's cheap to do this. Right? It's, it's essentially free. I mean, yeah. there is, a, there is a hundred dollar application fee, but that's honestly just to make sure that they get on an airplane. Oh, okay. You know, right. that they. We, we we reimburse everything, flights, room, board. We even take them to a baseball game. Oh, wow. Um, you know, so, well, and like today, actually, I found out there's a private planetarium on top of this mountain. And the guy's like, hey, bring your teachers up here. We'll have a viewing at night. I'm like, score. So you are you come from a teaching background, right? Yep, 21 What's been, years. 21 years. Okay, very impressive. What's been the the largest benefit of, of having that teacher background in support of what you're doing with the league, do you think? Um, being able to make the connections curriculum wise, you know, a oh, lot of people, sure. <clears throat> a lot of people say we need to have a ham radio curriculum. We need to ha have a ham radio curriculum in school. You're not going to get a ham radio class in school. Um, instead, what we need is we need the ability to take ham radio or, or ra wireless technology concepts and connect them to other subjects and classes, you know, like connect them to your math and so we're creating lesson plans in a repository on the learning center of different lessons that you can tie in and we're tying all those into you know national standards mm -hmm. that's that makes a whole lot of sense <laughs> and, and being able to talk to administrators you know school officials it's the days of your average ham walking into a school and getting to go sit down in a classroom next to to bobby are gone right you right. know, so there's a way we have to have to approach them and and deal with that. So just having that, I guess, knowledge of how the system works and you know, how to kind of convince them that it's a good good idea for their school. I got a question from DD Radio. I said, "Are the teachers getting their license, and or are they already licensed when they so uh, the program?" Typically, about half of them are already licensed. What? Um, last summer, what I started doing is every teacher that signed up, I mailed them as soon as I accepted them, I mailed them the licensing materials to start studying. So even if their session is not until July, you know, my applications are due May 1st, so I'll have acceptances out May 6th or 7th or something. May 8th, I'm going to have a licensing manual sent to each one. If they're already licensed, they get whatever their next level is, you know, so if they're already a tech, they get their general. If they're already in general, they get their extra. And so I send all of that stuff out to them just so they can get that stuff. Now, because we're giving them amateur radio equipment like radios, this year there's a little kind of qualifying statement that you'll get everything but the transmitter parts. Until you're, if you're not licensed, Maybe and and as soon as you as soon as you show me you have a call sign, I'll throw it in the mail to you. There you now go. Maria up in the VEC does a, a wonderful job of working tests in for these people while they're there. Oh, great! So you know we we have test sessions while they're there. So 
95 percent of the people probably leave licensed that's that's fantastic so i mean it sounds like a lot it sounds like it was already good program but the improvements have have been coming in and it sounds like a lot of people are interested it sounds over five you could run another five sessions that's amazing so yeah, let's, I, I i could run countless numbers all year long if i had the money <laughs> Yeah, of course. So uh, walk me down or walk me through the, the AWR Learning Center a little bit here. I've got the website up. And people can take it. Okay, so this. what we have here, and this is an evolving thing as well. We have, and I'm going to have to make it a little bigger so I can. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, it might be a little so, small on your end. But so, you know, what we have here is we have several different courses. And in fact, several of the, the YouTube folks that are in the chat, Mike has a, a POTA course in here. Um, we the people create courses on how to do different things in amateur radio. Um, in fact, <clears throat> hint, Joe, hint, I, I'm looking for somebody to make a course on kit building. Hey, there just, you go. Just, just kind of saying, um, you know, and so we have courses on tons of different topics in here. We also use this as a kind of a repository for different webinars that we've had. So like right now we have the club leadership development series that we're doing. And so all of these get housed in here. Um, this is also where our lesson plans are gonna gonna end up. So teachers will be able to go in here and that'll be you know in front of the member wall. So teachers can go in if they're like, well, I'm curious about this. They can not only get lesson plans, but we're gonna have little video snippets of teachers teaching teachers how to teach it, if that makes sense. Rather than teaching the lesson for kids, we're gonna teach teachers how to actually teach the, the concept. Right. So, um, yeah, that's the learning center. And um, let's see what else have I got on. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah. what, I mean, it, it, anyone can go to that, though. That's open for everybody, right? Parts of it are. So the learning okay. center, you know, like all of the emergency communications courses, the teacher lesson plans, all of that stuff is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the more in-depth courses, yeah, that's a, a member benefit. So you need to be a member for that. Okay. For, so, like, to get to Mike's POTA course, you, you do need to be a member. Okay, sure. So, uh, I mean, an a AWRL member is... Yeah. Right. Okay, but that's kind of the, the, the gateway for a lot of that information. Yeah. Because Mike's, Mike's information is super value-added, so you should become a member just for uh, for that alone, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, just for Mike. And, just you know, for and, Mike. And, and then everything Mike. else is a, is a bonus. Everything else gravy. is just gravy on that's top. That's it. Uh, you sent a ton of pictures, and I, I think there's definitely a telling narrative in your journey that you've been on the last couple of months, um, and also a, a bit of the the fun personality you have. I didn't I didn't plan for this to happen, but literally while we were uh, doing this little talk here, did you notice the ad that was uh, above? Right there? I did. In fact, that was that. Is that a plant? Did you do that, uh, Steve? No, I didn't before? do that. But as soon as so, Janet up in our advertising department asked me one day if I've ever, ha ever tried this coffee. And I was like, I have not. I mean, I've if I have, I don't know. And she goes, well, they're going to advertise with us. And she goes, what do you think? Is it worth it? I'm like, it's coffee. Of course it's worth it. <laughs> have you, know, you tried yeah, it? Because... No, not yet. Okay. Um, they they ordered a, a little sample pack of it in Becky's department, the editorial okay. section back there. And then I had to leave town unexpectedly for a funeral. And by the time I got back, it was gone. So now I have to order my own. Oh darn! Uh, it it's in, it, I'm curious. I'm always curious a ham's take on coffee because it it should be a should be an interesting try there. So we got a couple other links here. Where where do we go next here, Steve? Or do you want to pull up pictures? Um, you can pull up whatever you want. I can kind of roll with the the flow here. Well, let's so, hit the donate or or how you know. Obviously, there's a lot going on. You want to do more of these sessions, and how might people help you facilitate that? So. Here, here's the thing, and I didn't really understand this last year when I was starting this. Um, you know, like I said, I have a couple different buckets, so to speak, of money mm -hmm. that I can use. I have that education technology fund, which is purely used for the actual session itself. It pays for teachers' travel. It pays for the equipment, um, which, by the way, I'll go ahead and shout out all of the people who I've reached out to, you know, vendors and whatnot to get some of this equipment have been more than willing to work with us on getting some discounts for teachers because it's going free to teachers. Right. Um, so that money comes out of the education technology fund. So oh. generally there, I'm not, I'm in pretty good shape there. I mean, you know, I could probably run a couple more sessions out of there and where, where I, I start to 
have to argue, I guess, for my my budget <laughs> is is travel money for things like going to teacher conferences. Okay. Because while technically I could probably pay for it out of that other bucket, it's not really what it's there for. You know, it's I could probably it it does grow the program, but mm -hmm. we believe that going to teacher conferences and stuff like that. So that comes out of just our general fund. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you're, your membership dues, that helps pay for that. So if you are a member, um, thank you very much for that because you help me get teachers in. Um, if you're a Diamond Club member, thank you for that. That's that's where I pull that stuff from. Oh, okay. So, you know, when, when people like ask questions like, well, what does Diamond Club do for anything? Well, that's exactly what it helps me do. Excellent. Is, you know, it helps me fill five more teacher sessions by – you know, getting out and meeting teachers and creating these partnerships. Okay. Well, there you go. So I, I just updated the link, so everything should be updated there as well to all the links you provided. Man, there's a lot of different funds. I didn't realize that. Holy smoke. Yeah, I mean, there's a – Whoa. You know, there's <laughs> some, something for everyone in there. If, if like, emergency communications is, is your thing, there's the MCOM. I mean, there's 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 a bunch of them in there. That's – wow, that's super. Okay. Hey, there's even a – Oh, the Spectrum Defense Fund. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's take a look at some of these these images. This is your first one, by the way. Thank you. This for is my first this. one, and this is, um, because I wasn't busy enough. Yeah. Right. Becky and and Dana, her managing editor, came to me and said, "Hey, would you be willing to write a monthly column in QST?" And I kind of gave him the look of like. Because I'm already working, you know, already, I'm up at four something in the morning. So when I was joking earlier that it's past my bedtime, it really is past my bedtime. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know, what do you want it to be about? And they, once they told me it was highlighting different, you know, YouTube and media outlets that are, are useful, I was like, well, yeah, absolutely, I'll do that. And then they gave me another one in on the air, too. But, yeah. you know. Well, <laughs> thank you for doing that. That was very nice. So, and this, I mean, this is, honestly, it's it's a joy to write these. This is... Because I, I have so little time, I guess. In fact, it feels weird sitting here in front of the camera because it's been forever since I've actually played YouTube. Right. Because I'm so busy. So yeah. I actually get to force myself to kind of hone in and, and watch some videos that otherwise, I'm, I mean, my to watch list is ridiculously long right now. And I think there is. And then I've, yeah, th this is me packing for my road trips to teacher conventions mm -hmm. um to save money i don't ship anything i check it all as baggage so oh. you know I, I i lug the i'm allowed 70 pounds on delta because i have medallions so that that big pelican case is 68.75 pounds wow um, <laughs> wow and, so, and so I, I break it up and this yellow case is i've started taking the flex maestro with me oh interesting sure because You're demonstrating yeah yeah, for demonstrating because I, I don't have to set up an antenna, obviously. It, it just remotes right into the flex at W1HQ. Right. And so this way I'm able to demonstrate a lot of these these modes. I can make contacts here. In fact, at, I think it was in, in Atlanta. In fact, it's one of the pictures I sent you. Mm -hmm. There's a kid that was there with their parents, and I, I probably spent 30 minutes with that kid showing him stuff on the radio. He ended up talking to a dude in Slovenia. Whoa, and, uh, that's super made cool. Made his day. He's like, whoa. I mean, but, you know, just having the ability to tune around and show people this is modern amateur radio. It's not It's not what it used to be. T times are a changing or have changed, and they'll right. continue to change. Yeah. That's my baby cakes, the child unit. So With the G9. Obviously. She's still yeah, getting that G9. She, she comes up. Um, <laughs> This year, she'll only be up for a few weeks in the summer because she got a, a summer counseling gig at the college she's at down there. But uh, so when she came up at this is Christmas break, we had a warm day. So we scooted out and activated a park. Coffee on the table. There, you notice coffee. the trend. Yeah, of course. So this, coffee on the table. This is that image that you put in. It says, see, guys, no matter how busy I am, I can still get outdoors, right? And still play yep. radio. <laughs> so. And ha having the kiddo hit, this was an adjustment for me. <laughs> you know, I, I moved here from Mississippi and I came out and I was like, oh my goodness, what have I done? So well, like and this, like a this is a buffalo. regular occurrence here. This is, this is kind of, yeah. This is... All right, so these are teacher conferences I'm going to. One of the main things that I'm getting out of here, well, yeah, there's never not coffee. 
Um, but one of the things is, in addition to just getting teachers to come to these conventions, it's finding other people and organizations that we can partner with. Mm -hmm. You know, there are tons of us that are doing things that are remarkably similar, trying to get into STEM fields. Like, for example, um, I think I sent it to you. There's a picture with several other people like the ISS National Laboratory and um, Limitless Space. They're <clears throat> space That's in and, the list. And, that's in the um, yeah, that looks like maybe it. Yep, that's it. Yeah. So all of these young ladies here, they work for different they actually I think they're all nonprofits, but different organizations that are space tied. Okay. You know, they're all like one of them is Limitless Space Institute, where basically it's in order to explore anywhere we have to figure out how to go faster and stuff like you know, and but all of them or none of them really deal with the communications aspect of it mm -hmm. and i was like you know no matter how f where you go once you kind of leave where wires can reach you need you need radio and so they're like oh so we're starting to create some partnerships where you know they all have summer institutes where they're they're doing stuff with teachers so we're gonna we're starting to build these relationships we're like hey you know how about they come to my teacher's institute then we send them to your space institute or vice versa right and you know working together and we're talking about doing some joint venture stuff where um we kind of give a, an abbreviated version of teachers institute and kind of cater to space stuff at the oh, same time excellent oh there we go <laughs> i had to borrow that one for the thumbnail yeah that, that one, one's pretty perfect yeah that's that's pretty much me at every conference so in fact it's it's often enough that oh. people come by and see me with coffee that even the attendees have started bringing me coffee. It's I like, did. You know, I brought you a whole bunch of it. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, there's, year, I think, yeah. You know, even, but even at teacher conferences where these people don't know me from anyone, oh. it's like they're like, well, I, br I brought you a coffee because you it's like, oh, thank you. And at first I was like, I hope they're not like trying to drug, drug me or something. You know. <laughs> so these are uh, as kind of another little thing that I do at these things you meet more hams at teacher conference than you really realize are out there. Sure. Sure. And, um, so th this guy's actually, I think he was South Korean. Oh, cool. so he has his South Korean call sign. Oh, and, and you know, he's working here in the States. And so he's like, yeah, I need to go get my, my American call sign. So, you know, we tried to, excuse me, we tried to get somebody on the, on the radio form that, but it just wasn't cooperating right when he was there. So that's super cool. Uh, now you're just, that's fine. Yeah. The world does run on Duncan up here. Uh, yeah, that's also a thing for sure. And um, this is uh, just more teachers that are. But this is what the know, booth looks like. This right? is what the booth looks yeah. like. And this was actually a shared booth. Because that's the other thing is these conferences are ridiculously expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, just like I'm going to a conference in June that it's probably it's the biggest education conference in the world. And just the booth space is sixty one hundred bucks. Wow. And so, you know what? Another thing that we've started doing is like I'm partnering with Aris on some of these expensive booths. We're both preaching the same message. So why do we need to have two booths to preach the same message? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we go in together and split the cost of some things. And, you know, now we're, we're doing that. Um, and here I'm showing off that little Geocron because that's another thing. It's got a wow factor. Indeed. You know. And <laughs> more coffee. <laughs> and okay, so this guy actually is funny because I called him the cool physics guy because I mean he was completely nerding out with me when we started talking about it, and he's like, "Oh, this and that and the other." And I said, "Look, I said I'm going to have way more applications than I'm going to have spots. So when you fill out your application, make sure you put on there, I'm that cool physics guy." There and we so go. So he actually, yeah. he, I got his application the other day. And name says that cool physics guy, and then under it he gives me his real name. I was like, okay, you're in. So, but yeah, he was just <laughs> another another cool kid. You know, we've got some some great teachers coming. This is Rosie from ARDC. Um, she came up to visit. I don't know. It's been a few weeks ago, and uh, she has her technician license. Hadn't made any HF contacts, and I was like, <laughs> I got a place that we can go, and so. She we w went across the parking lot, got her on the air at W1AW, and she was working the pile up like a boss. But she was melting people's brains. If anybody 
actually made a contact with her. She, you know, as hams were used to, you know, hey, you know, you're five nine seven three. Have a great day. And Rosie's like, hey, yeah, you're five nine. So tell me, what was the best thing that happened to you today? <laughs> and and people are just like, uh, that's great. So, but she had a great time, and so did the people she got to talk to. There's Rosie again and Ed, and I think you had Ed on here from uh, the M17. Yeah, project. M17. Yeah, well, yep. he's definitely been on great videos. Dude. Yeah, um, super cool. He's kind of a personal hero because every time he comes up, he brings me a bag or two of coffee. Oh, that's the, the and he also gave me the, heart. Yeah, he that, that's the key to my heart right there. And he gave Jarek and I a, a quick tour of New York City. So this is one of our Teachers Institute sessions. Um, this lady right here is from Mississippi, Don. So you know, stomping grounds down there. Uh huh. But um, the other thing that we've started doing is taking them outside and actually showing them how to deploy these things outside. I mean. You know, I bring in a grill and we grill some burgers and hot dogs and and whatnot. We play radio outside for half a day, you know, I show do. them how to set it up, show them how to actually. And they make contacts. It's, it's great to learn it in the classroom. Yeah, <laughs> that's but, great. You know, they actually have to figure and, th and they do. They start to figure out, my gosh, it's harder to get that stupid bag over that limb than you think it is. Right. But having done it now, they'll feel more comfortable when they take this yeah. back home. This is probably one of the coolest is, yeah. parts of my job. Okay. All right. What is this? Um, every time a Ute comes into W1AW with with their grandparent or parent or whoever, Joe Karsha and I kind of have a, an, an agreement. He calls me immediately so I can come run across the parking lot and and talk to the kids. Um, okay. Those kids aren't aren't licensed yet. But, you know, he was, they were here with their grandfather, and the grandfather was basically wanting to come play radio at W1AW. Oh, and I, I went over there and went fishing for the kids. Oh, nice. And so in that room right here is where we run FT8. Oh, uh, okay. So that's what I'm showing those kids right there. And if, the older one here ended up sitting there for over an hour running wow. FT8. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, amazing. he just fell in love with it. So, you know, for people who say FT8 is not real radio, Consider he likes it. Consider who, <laughs> right? Consider the, the yeah. market, right? Yeah, so. I'm with you. This is where we hold our teachers' institutes. Um, it's I kind of take over the boardroom or the conference room. Um, um, there's a big space that I'm going to try to convince them to let me have and create it into a classroom if I can get the the funding. It's it's there. I just have to get it. But So this is kind of the way it looks at, this is, I guess, day two. And so they've opened everything, and there's goodies everywhere. I know that's yeah. not food on paper plates. We use those to hold components. <laughs> they're building parts. So they're playing. That's the heart of the, the whole thing, right? That's the heart of the whole thing is playing and figuring out how to make things go. That's just our logo. For yeah, them, but so. good, but good I'll throwing that up there I'll give again. you a T-shirt with that logo if you're a teacher and you come. So Hey, all right. Well, Steve, uh, I've got links in the description. For people that are interested in this, obviously, you know, people watching that may not be educators, I know you know an educator. You can definitely pass a lot of this information on and, and make sure you also check out, uh, what was it again, the Learning the learning Center, right? The Learning Center, yeah. And I'll throw that up again one more time. But mm -hmm. anything else but you anything want people else? to know before we uh, wrap it up here? Um, well, I was recently named the IRE Region 2 Youth Coordinator oh, back in February. Well, and so that's another hat that I'm now wearing that, you know, we're because like I said, I don't ever have enough to do. So so we're net we're now working to try to try to build something similar in Central and South America. You know, Neil does a great job with Yoda Camp here, but it's it's pretty cost prohibitive and time prohibitive for a lot of the people in Central and South America because I mean some of those visas take nine months. And so we're working to try to find a way to you know, have more more of these sessions down there for our Spanish speaking and Portuguese speaking folks. And somehow Greenland fell into region two. I'm not sure how that happened. Interesting. So, that is kind of odd. So I've got Greenland, so I'm trying to convince them that they need to send me to Greenland for something. Yeah. Well Steve, it's uh it's it's great to have you on here as a as a guest host. Feel free to chime in as things come up. But uh, you know, thank you know, just thanks for taking the time. So, and thank you for having me. So as always, great fun. job, Stephen. Thanks so much. Keep great job. Thank you, Gordo. Obviously, you must be getting things done because you know what they say: whenever you want to get something done, you can. And I'll to be a glad to person. help with your your kit lessons.
<laughs> Sold. <laughs> All right. All right, well, let's uh, take a moment from a word from ICOM. Got cabin fever? Look no further. Spring is just around the corner, and ICOM has what you're looking for. Our top quality base stations, mobiles, and handhelds are perfect for working your favorite bands inside the ham shack or venturing out this spring. ICOM's newest FM transceiver is the ICV3500, and it's ready to hit the road whenever you are. With a compact body and simple interface, this radio is a must for those looking for a long-range mobile with a fresh look. Go further with 65 watts output and get louder with 4.5 watts of audio with the ICV3500. The rugged ICOM IC T10 Portable meets or exceeds standard military testing. With an IP67 waterproof rating, the IC T10 can withstand any field activities ahead, hear any transmission, and listen to FM broadcast with a loud 1500 milliwatt speaker. The IC T10 is an excellent choice for any bug out bag. The IC7300 is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. With RF direct sampling, the IC7300 changes the way entry-level HF is designed. The IC705 is a perfect sidekick and QRP companion. Base station features and functionalities at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs just under 2 pounds with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the optional backpack LC192 with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories. The ID52A is a VHF UHF dual bander with D-Star and FM dual mode functions and is the first handheld amateur radio with a full color 2.3 inch waterfall display. This radio supports conventional FM communications and D-Star simplex, repeater, regional, and worldwide calls over the D-Star Internet Gateway. Send photos over D-Star with a connected Android device. The ID52A is a perfect companion to the IC705. Both use compatible batteries and headsets, and you can also use the same Android app for D-Star operation. Learn more about these and all the great ICOM radios at icomamerica.com slash amateur for the love of ham radio. And a huge thank you to ICOM for sponsoring the show here, Ham Nation. Every time we go live, we give away three swag packs. You take the link in the description, you click enter now and enter your information, and they'll pick three winners every time we're live. The winners of those swag packs this week are Bill SN6WLM, Keith R, KM6, VK, and Lisa M. Every month, though, we give away a radio. And this month, we're giving away an ICOM IC2730, one of my favorite mobile radios to recommend to people for its ease of use. And you could do satellites with it because it's cross-band uh, capable. The winner for that radio is Larry H, KS9J. So congratulations to all the winners and a big thank you again to ICOM. Don, how are things on your end or has, uh, has Lon invaded the show? <laughs> Lon is always, uh, always nearby. Under the surface. Yes, yeah, he, he really is. And uh, yeah, I, I'm so sick that I'm going to miss the Hamvention this year. But uh, what I will tell you is that Newsline is going to be there with the Newsline Town hall meeting once again. It hasn't been there in some time since uh, Bill Pasternak uh, passed away. WA6 ITF, there he is. There's his license plate behind me. So on um, Friday, May 19th, from 11.35 until 1 o'clock, we'll have the uh, Newsline town hall meeting where we'll have Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, to talk about the current progress of the volunteer mentor program. Mark Smith, N6MTS, he'll uh, talk about his proposal for the open headset interface standard. And Tim Ellum, president of the IARU, will talk about the current status of the IARU, their relationship with the AWRL, and uh, some other current issues of interest to the general ham radio public. It's going to be a really nice 
uh, 90 minutes or so, and you really should check that out. Don't miss it. The return of the Newsline uh, Town Hall meeting, Friday, May 19th, 1135. I'm not sure which um, I'm not sure which uh, room it's going to be in, but just check the uh, uh, check the newspaper and, uh, and for a theater near you or check your theater for a newspaper near you. We've got uh, Dr. T has got very, very fresh, hot off the press solar information right after this from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 2,373. This is Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, April 26, 2023. Our top story takes us to Washington, D.C., where two new FCC offices are taking a closer look at how to better handle all those satellites in orbit high above our planet. Hoping to get a better handle on regulating satellites and reducing the effects of orbital debris, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission has added two new departments under its umbrella, the Space Bureau and the Office of International Affairs. The move replaces the agency's International Bureau, which handled licensing and regulation of satellite programs and international telecommunications. The FCC's announcement did not specify what impact, if any, this move would have on amateur radio satellites. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said at an opening event for the new departments that they would, quote, promote long-term technical capacity to address satellite policies and approve our coordination with other agencies on all these issues, end quote. The departments are expected to coordinate their efforts in such areas as the 2023 World Radio Communication Conference. The conference will take place in Dubai starting on November 20th. This is Andy Morrison, K9AWM. If you're an active CW operator and would like to take your speed and proficiency to the next level, Newsline anchor Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, has some good news for you. A free course in comprehensive instant character recognition is being offered by CW Innovations with the goal of helping active CW operators learn ways to increase their proficiency. The 10-week classes focus on teaching operators how to help themselves learn Morse code, addressing the mental and emotional roadblocks that have typically halted learners' progress. The class is designed for hams who can currently copy 10 to 15 words per minute and are already actively on the air having QSOs. Visit cwinnovations.net for details. The website includes an application form. If you've been wishing for Solar Maximum to come sooner rather than later in the current cycle, you might just get your wish, according to a group of solar physicists. The end of this year or sometime next year could bring maximum sunspot activity for Solar Cycle 25, according to Scott McIntosh of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and a team of solar physicists. The team presents its findings in a paper in the January edition of the Frontiers in Astronomy and Space Sciences. In the paper, the solar scientists make use of a terminator event during the previous cycle sometime in mid-December 2021 to project the maxima of Solar Cycle 25 and to forecast the cycle's amplitude. Although some might project differently for the future, this team Team believes it's best to keep your eye on the skies during the fourth quarter of 2023 and thereafter into the new year. This is Patrick Clark, K8TAC. A reminder, the nominating period for the 2023 Amateur Radio Newsline Bill Pasternak WA6ITF Young Hem of the Year Award is now open. You'll find more information and the nominating form on our website, arnewsline.org, under the Awards tab. We'll present the award in August at the Huntsville Ham Fest in Alabama. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news since 1976 at arnewsline.org. With Andy Morrison, K9AWM, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, Patrick Clark, K8TAC, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now, here's the solar update from our own solar physicist, Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. We're still recovering from that G4 level solar storm that we had just a couple days ago that brought Aurora as far south as Germany and France and uh, Arkansas and New Mexico and Texas and Arizona. Even Southern California got some Aurora and then as far north as Perth, Australia.
So we've had a lot of Aurora show. It's been wonderful, but the, believe it or not, the show isn't over yet. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, not only do you see that big coronal hole that's sitting around center disk, that's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone here over the next couple days and could send us some fast solar wind that could bump us up to storm levels. But also, if you take a look on the 24th, right about in the same area that we had that last big eruption, you can see another filament eruption. You see that poof? Yeah, that's a solar storm launching toward Earth. This one, it looks like it's going to go mainly south of Earth, but there is an Earth-directed component. But that's not over because just the day later, right about the same area again, poof, you see yet another solar storm launching. So we have two solar storms that are on their way to Earth. Most of it will go basically south of Earth and not give us nearly the impact that we had from this recent G4 solar storm. However, we are expecting more aurora, and with that fast solar wind, it could get us another decent show. So aurora photographers, better charge your batteries and take a look at your pictures later because more fun is on the way. Now, as we take a look, at our far-sided sun, this is stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. You can see that big coronal hole in the middle of the sun right there, but really what I want you to look at is to the east limb, because we do get a little bit of a hint, especially in the north. There's a new region that's going to be rotating into Earth view over the next couple days. It does look like it could be a solar storm producer and possibly a big flare player, and that means we're going to keep that solar flux boosted and we could have radio blackouts back on the menu. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, get ready. That, that uh, radio noise on the bands is definitely going to stay right about the minor noise level over this next week. And we could continue to have some more solar storm possibilities really over the next two weeks. Switching to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now this is NASA's version of the model. And you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. As we take a look at that model, you can see that solar storm being launched towards Earth. This is the first of two solar storms, but you can tell it's not moving all that quickly. And actually, the bulk of it is moving south of Earth. Nonetheless, it's going to clip Earth right about noon on the 27th, according to the predictions. And then the other storm will also clip us about a day later. But as you take a look, do you see that pinwheel that it's kind of embedded in? You've got these like spiral arms. Well, that is actually the impact from that fast solar wind kind of compressing the slow solar wind ahead of it. And that is actually going to make boost that storm level and actually enhance it a bit. So aurora photographers expect to have another decent chance for aurora starting early on the 27th. And then as it, what the storm actually hits, you could get even a bigger brightening. So keep those batteries charged. It's going to be a potential for another great show. Not like the big solar storm that we had just a few days ago. This one's probably just going to be a minor storm. But nonetheless, we could get more chances for gorgeous sights. For more details on this week's space weather, including how these two new solar storms could affect space traffic and radio comms, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. All right, thank you, Dr. T. We certainly appreciate your efforts in uh, keeping us up to date and, and putting it in, in words that we can actually understand, at least, at least for me. I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree, that's for sure. But to follow her on Twitter, at Tamitha Scove, also her Facebook channel, Tamitha Scove, and, of course, spaceweatherwoman.com. In two weeks, we are going to uh, talk more about Dayton because it'll be the last show before Dayton, and I'll give you a quick preview of something that I'll be talking about, about Hamvention. It's uh, uh, Gordon, you had asked me earlier what some of my, my favorite things about Hamvention are, and, well... You all know I kind of got a thing for these. <laughs> <laughs> right. There it is. 2023. We'll talk more in depth about this on the 10th. So, Joe, over to you, my friend, and, and get you a lanyard, Joe. Get get you get get two. They're cheap. I sure will. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll be looking for those when I get there. And uh, for those of you coming into Hamvention, I mentioned earlier that uh, I will be on the talk-in on Thursday between 9 and 1. And uh, uh, I'll be wandering around the rest of the weekend taking pictures. And uh, saying hi to me increases certainly increases your chances of being in my slideshow. And everybody wants to know what song are you going to use? And... This year, it's going to be Wang Chung's Everybody Have Fun Tonight. 
So we're going to have fun at Dayton, and everybody have fun tonight will be the song that I'm going to be setting the uh, the slides to. So let's take a look here. We're going to look at my journeys over the last four weeks, and I do apologize in advance. I will be missing the show in two weeks because that is my local club meeting. But that means that right after Dayton, I'm going to have all sorts of pictures and probably, hopefully, my slideshow will be all done and ready to go. Now, what you're looking at here is uh, kind of the, the old dusty trail. Now, this is a road in northwest Arkansas, and we're going to start out my travels at OzarCon. Now, OzarCon is the annual gathering of the four-state QRP group. And it's a wonderful time, and Branson is a great place to go. You can bring your family. There's tons of entertainment shows to see. It's really, really a, a fun place to go for the whole family. And there's no shortage of things to do in Branson. Uh, this is the road going up Boat Mountain. Uh, it's about 2,200 feet and does qualify as a summit on the air. And there was uh, commercial broadcast uh, stuff up there. And so, uh, which is kind of normal for mountaintops. Uh, this is in northwest Arkansas. So it was about an hour drive from uh, Branson. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I can take my own car. And my friends said, no, you're riding with us in the SUV because your Prius would never make it up the roads there. And I, once I got in the car and I realized they're all kicking it into four-wheel drive, uh, no, I don't think my Prius would quite make it up there. Um, but uh, uh, Summits on the Air is a lot of fun. And... Uh, um, this is uh, Gary, uh, W0MNA, uh, and his wife, uh, Martha, uh, W0ERI, and we're working sideband on 20 meters from on top of the mountain. And uh, the little tower and shack there used to be a repeater site for the hams. So uh, we had at least a place to hang wires from as well as uh, nearby trees. And I was participating as well. You can see me with my little laptop and my little T1 tuner on the ground and hooked to the antenna. And I'm using the uh, uh, QRP Labs QDX, uh, which mine puts out about four watts, four and a half watts of uh, digital modes. It is an SDR. And uh, I made several FT8 contacts from the summit. And so we did summits on the air, like I said, with digital modes with a transceiver that could fit in your shirt pocket. And there's uh, myself again operating on FT8. And you can see inside this uh, case on the right sitting on the stool there, uh, the radio itself is very tiny. It's it's just like the size of a big deck of cards. A uh, wonderful kit to put together. Uh, lots of toroids, but a wonderful kit to put together. Uh, this is our Summits on the Air team. Uh, we went in three different vehicles. And uh, we're stopping for our lunch break there in Arkansas. Uh, no shortage of barbecue places uh, there. And then we went to another mountain. I can't remember the name of the mountain that was the second one. And this guy here is operating about 50 watts, actually, with full battery power uh, using a uh, KX3 as well as the amplifier and uh, a little mobile antenna-like thing he put on the barbed wire fence. And that, that certainly made a good ground plane. And uh, conditions were a little rugged. Uh, we were having a bit of solar difficulties that day, but uh, we still made lots of contacts. Now, the other activity that associated with SOTA is POTA, and that's Parks on the Air. And uh, uh, K0... Uh, EMT there, he, um, uh, EMI, I uh, can't remember, um, he uh, um, 
was teaching a class on how to log in and put your logs up online and had like four different antennas for us all to plug into on different bands. And uh, I once again did digital modes and uh, uh, set up my little laptop, everything running on battery power. And uh, uh, this was Table Rock State Park at Table Rock Lake, not far at all. In fact, it's right there in Branson. So very easy to get to and a lot of fun to activate. Um, this is Andrew and his wife. I uh, His call is on his shirt, but I can't read it. Um, and this was uh, one of his first times ever on HF, let alone uh, Parks on the Air. And uh, he was using an IC705. And uh, they were having fun activating their first park on the air. And uh, this guy here was operating using one of those little mountain topper radios. And if you ever listen to it, it has wonderful filtering on CW, kind of a neat little radio. And uh, it's another one of those shirt pocket size radios. And uh, he is having fun with his mountain topper. Um, this is the uh, kit build that we had at OzarkCon. And uh, the person on the right is David Kripe, NM0S. And next to him is his wife, who was actually building that night. And uh, David is the designer for most of the four state QRP kits. Oh. And so uh, he's behind a lot of that. And if you go to four days in May, I think he's the chairman of that. And you can see him at club night or vendor night. Vendor night's my favorite. That's Thursday night and it's free and open to everybody to come in. Um, this is the kit we were building. This is the four state uh, QRP uh, surface mount dummy load kit. Now, the neat thing about this is uh, not only does it work with about 10 watts or so of RF, but it has a bar graph of LEDs and they light up at half watt, one watt, two watts, and five watts. So it gives you a pretty good indication of what your little QRP radio is putting out. And I always tell people when they're building kit radios, especially QRP radios, to connect it to a dummy load first because if you power up, let's say, a transceiver and it's accidentally keyed and there's no antenna on it, well, you could burn it up before you got a chance to try it. So always uh, power up your kits first into the dummy load. And uh, uh, this is the case that was originally designed by Jim, W0EB. And uh, I improved a little bit on the lid to uh, line up the holes a little better for the LEDs. And uh, uh, so I did a little extra CAD work myself. And uh, it looks wonderful in the case made on my 3D printer. Uh, so a neat thing to have in your pocket or in your go kit when you're doing uh, parks or summits on the air or when you're building kits at home. Uh, that's what it looks like from the bottom. Uh, it uses 440 uh, hardware, uh, inch-long uh, screws, and uh, uh, two sets of four nuts to uh, put it together, four to hold the board and another four nuts to hold the lid. Makes a nice compact case, and it has the four-state QRP group logo on it. And uh, during the kit build, uh, this is, once again, Gary, uh, W0MNA from Kansas, and he is testing out the kits. Uh, I did all the troubleshooting and desoldering and resoldering uh, to help the builders and show them how to do those techniques. And he was the one testing all the kits, making sure they all work. Uh, the following week uh, takes me over a, a few hundred miles from there to the Tulsa area, actually Claremore, Oklahoma, but we have to uh, always show the driller when you get to Tulsa. And this is uh, the uh, Green Country Ham Fest. And of all the ham fests that you will see from me, this one was the actual biggest in terms of attendance. I think this was around a thousand or so. Uh, 
And uh, it has over well over 100 and some tables at this thing. And uh, it goes from Friday afternoon at 4 to Friday night at 9 and then back open at 8 o'clock on Saturday until 3 in the afternoon. And a lot of people stick around a lot longer than you'd think. And there's dealers and uh, just a huge flea market there. And it's held at the Claremore Expo Center, about two blocks away from the Will Rogers Museum. So you can learn a bit about the guy who I like to call the patron saint of Oklahoma. Uh, when I got home from there, I got some stuff together and I finished the kit that we were talking about earlier. And, uh, what you're looking at is the inside of the Saguaro, uh, kit from DZ kit. This is a general coverage receiver kit. And uh, you can see the power supply is in place and the, the shield is over the transformer and the, uh, the Raspberry Pi board is in place as well as the uh, 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 SDR play. And uh, all the interconnect cables are hooked up and the controls are hooked up. And so it's ready to be put on the air. And this is what the front screen looks like. Uh, and it is a touchscreen. So if you want to change which of those bands you are looking at, you just touch it with your finger. I found, though, that sometimes I was a little clumsy. So I use one of those pens that you get that's got the little rubber stylus on the eraser head. And it works wonderful with this. Uh, and in this picture, I'm just listening to WWV at 10 megs. And then over here, I'm listening to WRMI on 5.050, or what I call the nifty 5050. And uh, coming in nice and clear on this radio, it's got a big speaker, and so it puts out a lot of sound. And uh, this is what the radio looks like, uh, all completed. It is about a 12-hour build, so you want to put some time aside for doing this. And... Uh, a uh, wonderful radio and uh, a lot of fun to play with. Uh, and he is constantly putting out firmware that adds new features and refines the functions a little more. In fact, he put one out while I was in California, and I'm going to load that in this week and test that out. Um, this is kind of a close-up of the screen. As you can see, it breaks out the FM broadcast band into several segments. And I'm tuned to 92.9, which is a local uh, classic rock radio station here in Nebraska. Uh, this is what the back panel looks like when it's all done. As you can see, there's a couple of jumpers that are there. And uh, you can plug in a keyboard and mouse. Uh, you don't have to use his software. If you're using his software, your top-end frequency is the top of the FM broadcast band. If you use, I uh, can't remember the name of it, uh, there is another SDR program, and you can run that with a mouse and keyboard, and uh, it'll work with that as well, all the way up to 2 gigahertz general coverage receiver. Nice case, nice amplifier, nice loud sound on the speaker. So then the following weekend, I only drove three hours away. So the first two were each about seven or eight hours. Uh, this is only three hours away in Kansas City. And this is the annual Ararat Shrine Temple Ham Bash in Kansas City. And uh, uh, you can see we had some exhibits outside. Uh, you had the Johnson County ARES and uh, some demo uh, stuff there behind the uh, Shriner statue. And this is what it looks like inside. And this is another big flea market. This is probably the biggest one in the Kansas City metro area. And it's kind of a must uh, visit ham fest in this area and uh, lots of bargains to be had. Uh, this is, uh, I think it's Steve from Alpha Antennas, and he's doing some demos out there in the parking lot as well. And uh, a lot of fun. In fact, using the ICOM 705 barefoot with the, the loop, I was able to talk to a special event station from West Virginia on 20, and it worked quite well. They were easily able to hear me. Uh, so the following couple of days later, I get on the plane and I head out to Visalia, California. 
And uh, this is the home of the International DX Convention, the largest DX convention in the world. It's held there because it's between the uh, Bay Area and the Southern Cal area, like L.A. and San Diego. And it's right in between, and the groups uh, take turns running it, but it's always been held in Visalia. That may change. Um, uh, there is there is a problem with the Southern California group, and we're trying to find out what's going to happen. We're hoping it'll be next year, but it's a strong possibility. We might miss a year, but... Uh, the convention is in Visalia, and it attracts DXers from all over the world. They were from uh, South America and Sweden and Finland and Germany and uh, also Mexico. And uh, uh, the people sitting next to me at the banquet included one that was on the uh, um, uh, Beauvais expedition. So uh, you got to learn quite a bit at this one. Uh, so when you go there... What do you get to see besides the convention? Well, I wanted to see Yosemite, and it turned out to be too much of a problem to get there. So instead, I was directed to Kings Canyon to see the sequoias, because most of the sequoia park is also buried in snow. And you can see the snow is way over what the roof of the car would be. And in reality, you're only looking at about a third of what the snowfall actually was this winter. Absolute record snowfall is what they told me, 250% of normal. And kind of way down the road, but you can't see it easily in this picture, is one of those stakes that, that they use to mark the road for snow plows. And that, that thing goes up like 25 feet, and they told me the snow was over that. So the roads were okay to get to Kings Canyon, as opposed to Fresno, where it was 74 degrees. Uh, it was 37 degrees when I was up there, actually as cold as 35. So it kind of made me feel like I was back here in Nebraska. Uh, but this is what you get to see. You get to see the, the uh, giant sequoias, uh, quite a view. And so next time, obviously, I'm going to try to see Yosemite as well. Uh, to get into the visitor center there, you had to go through a metal tunnel because the snow blocked the entrance to the visitor center. So this is really something. Oh, wow. uh, you had to go through the tunnel to get in the building. Now back to the Hamfest in Visalia. Lots of big forums. Uh, forums were very well attended. Uh, there is no flea market at this. We have more banquets and luncheons and um Lots of seminars, but there is an exhibit hall and uh, uh, not a lot of exhibitors, but uh, some nice exhibits as well. Um, and this is one of them here. Uh, lots of uh, supplies that a DXer might want to have. And uh, this was a November 6 Victor. I got to operate it for about 20 minutes. And this was an Elecraft K4D along with an external display and uh, external tuner, as well as the KPA 500, which is the amp that I use at home. And uh, there were people working on sideband on FT8 and CW. And so uh, this was my first time to have my hands on a uh, uh, K4 and uh, quite a fun little radio. Um no, uh, this is the answer to the next question. I didn't win anything major, <laughs> just at one little small prize. There were over 10,000 tickets in the barrel, wow. and they had sold out the raffle within the first couple of hours on Friday. It was amazing. I They said that they usually sell about half that many tickets, and uh, this time the attendance was down about, 30 or 40% uh, because this was the uh, first convention since 2019, but yet the raffle sold out. So that was quite something. No, I did not win anything big. Uh, this is one of the banquets. This is the Saturday night banquet. And uh, just as people were getting seated and over 400 people attended the banquet. And uh, the presentation was all about Beauvais and what they went through. And I think that's the end of my photos. So let me see here uh, if I can go like that. And I think you get me back. 
And uh, so that was kind of my travels over the last four weeks wow. and my kit building. And uh, uh, we'll be uh, back doing more kits and stuff. And I will see everybody on this show in four weeks uh, right after Dayton. And maybe uh, hopefully we don't have too many copyright problems with the one song. We'll have to figure that out. But uh, it won't be a 10-minute slideshow. It's going to be about Four and a half or five minutes. I, I, I think, got. Uh, I got a copyright claim for every one of the songs you put in the last one. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sure. About I don't that. know that we could do that one. again. <laughs> well, we, we could. We could talk after. We could figure something out. I think. Yeah, but uh, uh, it'll be uh, it'll be fun. And like I said, everybody have fun tonight. Think of that song <laughs> and think go. of going to Hamvention, and uh, you'll see why I picked it. And I look forward to seeing everybody at Dayton and look for the cat in the hat because that's how you'll find me in the crowd. And if you, you talk nice and I still have some, you might get one of those screwdrivers I have again. Uh, and uh, uh, you might get your picture in the slideshow. Well, uh, thank so, you, Joe. So oh, thank sorry. you very much, Josh, for having me on. Well, thank you, and, and thank every all of our hosts, including our guest host again, Steve. Steve is on the East Coast, so I'm sure he's loving life right now. He's uh, already probably through his second pot of coffee. Thank you again, Steve, for hanging out with us. Oh, no problem. That's my second pot tonight. It's probably my <laughs> sixth pot today. Oh, my God. So I wasn't kidding when I said Steve definitely enjoys his coffee. So we'll maybe we could do some videos in the future just talking about how you ham radio and coffee because that's all hams care about that kind of stuff it's important although you know i hadn't this is more time than i've spent in my shack since i moved into my house <laughs> so i told my wife i normally have to do my meetings upstairs and i told my wife so now i'm doing this one from the shack today because i haven't really gotten to spend any time in there good so. good well, good for you. Well, everybody, I think that's going to do it for us. We appreciate you taking the time. Is there any uh, last round the rooms anyone want to mention? Uh, Nets, we've got D Star. I have that. I have. It's been posted a couple of times. If you go back in the chat, it looks like it changed as far as uh, what reflector they were using. Anybody remember the other Nets while I look this one up? Uh, yeah, there it is. Ham Nation D Star After Show Net will be held on reflector 014 C now. Um, and it has a backup reflector. The backup is 35 XRF 35C. So keep that in mind. Check XRF 035C for the net. So hopefully that made sense to everybody. You want to look at the last one, the XRF 035C for the net. Uh, any other, what were the other nets? Gordo, you remembered it last time. Do you remember what the frequency is for the 40 meter net? Uh, I'll try and hover around 72.94. There you go. I uh, will update the show notes so I make sure I have the frequencies for the next time. But we do, of course, see, this is why we miss Amanda. Lots of little things like these. Uh, Amanda, we hope you get well soon. Take all the time you need to get better. That's what's most important to you. And uh, we're all out here thinking of you. You're very important to all of us, not just here on Ham Nation. And we really do appreciate you. And I appreciate all these guys. But until we talk to you all again, we'll say 73. See ya. Thanks so much, Steve. <laughs> Bye. No problem. 7-3, everyone.